Welcome to Live from My Drum Room with John D. Christopher. My guest is Jimmy Chamberlain, fabulous drummer with the Smashing Pumpkins, though you already knew that. And uh, I'm, I'm excited about this episode. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Jimmy's love and enthusiasm for the drums comes shining through. And uh, it's just so great to see that even after all these years, as far as he's come and uh, as accomplished as he's become as a drummer, he still has that passion and that desire to keep learning. And he's such an inspiration. Uh, kudos to Mark Griffith, who interviewed him for the July 2023 issue of Modern Drummer. Jimmy's on the cover. I actually happen to be featured in the same issue, and that sort of got us talking a couple of weeks ago about this. And uh, I want to just say again, it was an honor for me to be in the magazine just in general, and then to be in the same issue as my buddy Jimmy Chamberlain and, and uh, also Vince Wilburn was a huge honor. So I hope you enjoy this episode. We really do a deep dive into a whole bunch of things. This is part one. I'll post part two next week, but check this out. Enjoy it. And I'll see you on the other side. All right. See you. Thanks for watching and listening. Without any further ado, please welcome drummer extraordinaire and all around great guy, my old friend, Jimmy Chamberlain. Hey, Johnny. Hey, Jimmy. Great to see you, buddy. You know, us drummers and technology, it's like we never quite believe it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm realizing more and more about you that I, I see. I think of you as like a high tech guy, you know, but. Yeah, in a low tech world. <laughs> <laughs> in a low tech world. But you're giving me a look. But, you know, I know I know now. I mean, just. You know, I got to say, I love the article you did in Modern Drummer Magazine, the, the feature story. And I encourage everybody oh, watching. Yeah, man. It was so great. And everybody watching this, check out the new Modern Drummer issue with Jimmy Chamberlain on the cover. There's another guy in the magazine, too. But you got to check out <laughs> Jimmy. And um, We were reunited in MD, Johnny. That was amazing. I know. I know. I'm so honored. And, and I, I really, I when I contacted you i truly mean i was so honored to be in the same mentioned in the same uh magazine as you and uh but you know there's likewise such a great, yeah thank you thank you there's mark griffith did such a great job and did such a great deep dive into your uh you know your history and and it really kind of what makes you tick as a drummer and i so enjoyed reading it so congratulations yeah mark did a great um did a great job but somebody, my daughter may be uh, downloading a massive file in her bedroom or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. You, you know, know, my daughter's home from college. I can't believe she's 20 years old now. Wow. Wow. I know, right? I remember when she well, was let's born. Just go. Yeah. I know, right. I know you do. Let me just turn some lights on. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, this is my dining room. Um, so, you know, the one we never eat in, of course. <laughs> 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 but it, it looks great and when you, when you guys entertain you know it's like they go yeah Man, look at this people think room. we eat in here but we don't we eat out there in a the kitchen in this crappy old table <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah so just um just quickly you know getting back to the md uh interview yeah. you know mark mark did a great job and and it was so fun it was one of those interviews where you know a lot of those things can kind of be perfunctory and you know just kind of checking boxes but but Mark, I mean, he really, he really knows his stuff, you know, and yeah. once, and I, we had to edit out a lot of it because him and I were just blathering. I mean, we would go down like you and I, right. We would just go down rabbit holes and it would just be stuff that like, maybe no one was interested in, but us, right. <laughs> like we talked about Captain Beyond and Bobby Caldwell for like 20 minutes and, you know, all this crazy obscure stuff, but I, I think, you know, the genesis of it and the, and the bones of the article are really representative of kind of how the conversation went. And that, those are the best interviews. I had such a great time. And the two, three hours we spent talking just went right, you know, like, like you and I do. So yeah, it's always the yeah. hallmark of a great interview when it just becomes conversant and you're just, you know, you're just riffing. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I know from speaking with Mark, he, he knows his stuff and and you know your stuff so i could imagine the two of you guys getting together and just like you say getting into some some shit that goes really deep that not a lot of people you know are, are hip to frankly but well yeah we've been we've been on a jim gordon 
kick for now since the our, since the article wow. since the interview. So we've just been sending you know all this crazy Jim Gordon stuff back and forth. And Mark, you know, is an encyclopedia of all the obscure stuff that everybody's played on. So he sent me. I mean, I've been, you know, trying to find vinyl, old Hall and Oates singles, UK single only from the, like, yeah, you know, just trying to find the obscure stuff that makes us all kind of like unique, right? We want to hear, we want to hear people outside of their comfort zone, outside of the box. And... Absolutely, it's it's funny you mentioned Jim Gordon, Jimmy. I I am, um, I've been a huge fan, you know, for a long time, and probably the last almost ten years, I joined this this band, this this like cover classic rock band we play a lot of tunes that i found out jim gordon played on whether it's gordon lightfoot whether it's carly simon and uh and then when he passed away i really like you i really kind of did a huge deep dive and i i should get in touch with mark or maybe you and i can you know through emails or or uh text messages maybe just hit me to some of the tunes that you're checking out that i might not know about because i'd love to go deeper into his his catalog man he's yeah, I mean, he was, you know, every, everything that was everything that was great at that time was basically him. I mean, you yeah. know, and then and then Keltner, obviously, and you know, later Jeff Percaro and you know Randy Newmark, and those guys were just so so good. I mean, yeah, yeah. and so you know, always on point. But to maintain um, as uh, as a as strong an identity within the simplicity of that music. Um, is, you know, obviously the hallmark of a great drummer. I mean, you see, you know, Steve Gadd or Jim Gordon or people like that that can play identifiably. In any situation without making identifiable to us drummers, like we talk, I mean, Mark and I talked for 45 minutes just about Jim's ride symbol, right? And that's really how I still hear ride symbol to this day is that you know low spark of high heel boys like that traffic stuff where it's really um it's really expressive right and there's a million notes in the ride symbol and he's articulating accents and lighter accents in the context of the vocal and supplying shading and support to the narrative in a way that is just so musical yeah yeah exactly and perfect description uh, and perfect analogy because I hear his uh, his ride beat like you say in that song and low spark of high heel boys like you're so vain I, I I had Andy Newmark on my podcast a couple of years ago and we talked about Andy was originally supposed to record that song for Carly Simon he'd done anticipation and when they got to the session the producer um god uh I'm going blank on the producer. A famous producer basically said, I think I want to bring Jim Gordon in for this. And Andy was cool. He was like, I'm going to, I'm going to learn something here. I'm going to, and he watched Jim work. And he said, if, and I'll, I'll send you the clip I have of it. Cause there's just a, a, a 10 minute segment where we talk about that. And yeah, please do. Yeah, I will, Jimmy. And I, and if I remember correctly, he said, Jim Gordon came in and used the kit that was there. It wasn't, it was a kit. It was in London. I think it was a, a rented kit. He, I think he used the sticks that Andy had with him, just picked up Andy's sticks, <laughs> right. right? You know what I mean? Just came in and he said he was like a scientist. He sat down and he said the way he set the tune up with, you know, the cross stick sections, the, the, you know, the two and four hi-hat, eighth note hi-hat part, you know, during the verses and then the, the ride, the bell symbol. And he said he had it was like this life-changing eye-opening thing for Andy to see this guy come in and just like a professor, just kind of dissect the tune and go here, I'm going to, I'm going to put this here. I'm going to put this here. And it, the end result is this incredible composition of a song, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's it. You know, I think Jim was, um, was an incredible storyteller. Right. And, and I think when you're a great storyteller yourself, and you understand somebody else's story, you know how to support that story in a way that makes the story even more compelling, right? And that's, you know, when we get it, when we start talking about what exactly is it we do, like when we distill it down to the finest, you know, atomic particles, it's really, we just, we tell stories, right? And we, and we, 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 we lend information to people in a way that, that allows them to think a little bit differently, right? And that's, that's kind of our job. 
Yeah. And yeah. some guys just do it with such a plum that it's just, it's inspiring to the rest of us. And that's like, even like that Gordon Lightfoot record, I listened to it probably more than my wife wants, wants <laughs> to hear it, but it's just so, it's just such a great, you know, relearning of like what it takes to understand what a story is about. And I yeah. think that's when I hear great songs, you, you can hear you know, where everybody's in on the joke, right? Where everybody understands what the destination of the story is. And because they understand the story, they're able to make quality choices in, in how they play beats or how they, they um, deconstruct things or how they're going to lift something or, or maybe even bring something down. You know, that's a great storyteller. You know, like my, my kids went to Montessori school and they had this, this, wonderful lady, Catherine Jasinski, uh, my daughter for four years and my son for three years. And we used to go sit in the classroom sometimes and she would tell stories, you know, and there'd be this, a bunch of seven-year-olds, right? And this crazy electric <laughs> energy. And then her voice would get real quiet and you'd see all the kids lean in because they'd want to hear what she was saying, right? And I would be like, <laughs> and I always thought, man, she would be such a kick-ass drummer. Like, <laughs> like if she could, she could pull that shit off in the kit, we'd all, we'd all be yeah. in awe. Right. That's, that's great, man. Yeah. Great. And yeah, she had the dynamics like she had the, you know, yeah. she could. Yeah. Like when and Buddy then she'd play, deliver the yeah. chorus and it would be that holy shit moment. Like, oh, my God, yeah, this is the greatest thing ever. Wow. Dinosaurs. Right. Like, <laughs> uh, oh, but yeah, that. Gordon, you know, Gordon and, and Andy. I mean, I know Andy a bit. And, you know, those guys, those guys understood that in a way that you really you didn't have the accoutrements that we have today, right? To provide dynamics. I can go look and fishing for dynamics in a lot of places right now. Back then you had your ride symbol, crash symbol, a snare drum, and maybe a China symbol. If you were, if you, if you've had some money in your pocket at one time, yeah. you know, and that was like, <laughs> and that was, and that was kind of it. So you had to figure out how to make all that stuff work. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was just going to say too, and Jim Gordon, came from that school of of like making so much music from so you know from from a basic drum kit from you know whether it was a five-piece kit um a ride cymbal a couple of crashes a pair of hi-hats and as you pointed out like the ride cymbal would become two or three voices you know at a yeah. minimum yeah i mean whether it was the bell crashing it just the, the ride beat um you know, and, and, and not to say that it's it's come so far away from that, but we've all become very specialized now where a lot of drummers, yourself not included in this, I'll say, but a lot of drummers that their ride cymbal is just for playing the ride beat. You know, they've they've sort of lost that art of, of hey, there's, you know, about, I mean, Peter Erskine, we talk about Peter Erskine all day, someone that could get 50 sounds out of his ride cymbal, really. I mean... That's it, right. Yeah, and, and never be redundant in what he's playing um steve gadd you know there's so many tony like it's yeah right yeah yeah we listen to um we listen to um uh what was it um herbie hancock the other night my wife and i um i can't think of the song title now but tony on the drums where he just he breaks it down and just play cymbals for 16 bars, right? And a little bit of bass drum here and there. And it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so compelling and it's so understated in a way that just gives it a power that's kind of beyond its years, right? And I think, I think that's, in today's world, a lot of that stuff just gets kicked to the side, right? Even me, when we make, when we make new records, we have to be cognizant of like, I mean, it's like if you're going to write if you're going to write a bestseller, then you got to kind of know what the what the thirty bestsellers on the New York Times list is, right? If you want to be in that market, right? So it's we feel like it's incumbent on us to kind of have at least a rudimentary understanding of what the pop rock pop architecture is like, and then to try to create in that architecture. But it's off. It's it's definitely not as satisfying as it was you know we're we're going to do a siamese dream tour and our first two records later this winter and i'm back playing a lot of that stuff and that stuff is like it's like playing jazz fusion right it's like yeah 
I just do whatever the hell I want. It's just self-expression on top of a tune. And it's just, you know, we're all, we're all playing to the best of our ability. It's just super fun. It's a celebration of, you know, the tech, the technical ability of the instrument, you know, maybe somewhat, some, we were young, so somewhat, you know, maybe somewhat irresponsibly at times, but some, <laughs> but all in, all in, all in good, all in good spirits, you know, all the good yeah, intentions. Yeah. Um, but, you know, today you just don't, you just don't even think like that in the studio, unfortunately, which is why, you know, I try to play as much straight ahead, straight ahead gigs as I can, because I can go out there and I'm going to just go let my cat out, but it only takes, you know, as we say in the jazz world, it only takes five minutes to play five minutes worth of music. <laughs> I've never heard that. I love that. <laughs> Where in my, in my other gig, what's wrong with you? In my other gig, uh, it could take, years <laughs> to get five minutes worth of music done you know i mean of rearranging and tweaking and we're moving this chorus around and blah 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 yeah i don't know i just for me like i don't live you know i outside of music i, I like to race cars I, I ride a ducati i mean i don't i'm generally not a fear-based type of person so you know to a fault maybe i'm ready to just throw shit at the wall uh which you know <laughs> Much to the chagrin of some people, but some people like it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think that's cool to know that, though, that you guys put that much thought, the, this, the pumpkins put that much thought into, you know, you're not, um, I, I think it's kind of refreshing in a way, Jimmy, that you're not a self-indulgent band that says, well, we're going to, this is what we're going to make and fuck you guys if you don't like it. it. You know, you're thinking about this is kind of what, whether it's pop culture or the, you know, the sort of market is, is listening to right now. Um, but without, but without selling yourselves out, you're, you're still creating music that you guys want to create. Um, but I, yeah, but I, I th yeah, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I, I mean, I think that was always the thesis of the band, you know, the thesis or the challenge of the band was really, can we create music in a modern architecture that can be, you know, that can be, you know, you're so vain, or it can be, yeah. you know, those songs like, like Jim Gordon was able to do it, right? He was able to play like Jim Gordon on those songs that became seminal classics, if not standards. And he didn't compromise himself at all. I mean, he was just, yeah. he was just interpreting things in a responsible way in the moment that was culturally concurrent. And, and, you know, he did it in a way that was, you know, uh, really representative of him, what the way he would do it, whether 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 those were the qualifiers or not so i think you know our 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 challenge was always even in the 90s was can we can we be an alternative band and still write songs like tonight tonight and having you know disarm and songs with orchestras in them and and still remain contemporary and you got a guy like corgan who's you know that great of a songwriter and works so hard i mean he's literally the hardest working person i know i mean he's works day and night constantly on music he's just obsessed with it right and 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 he's also you know one of the best so i mean it's it's really it's hard to or it's it would it's not you know my job is to support that right and really just to be like uh, encouraging and saying because it's at the at the end of the day it's great stuff right yeah and it may not it may not be all the time what i'm listening to at home you know it's it's not you know um it's not one finger snap <laughs> or <laughs> right or you know i you know it's not it's not lifetime or you know the stuff that i'm listening to at home right or terry bozio drum solo solo for drum set right but um it does have uh, a lot of power and it is it, it it is something that's unique to us and something that we have sole ownership over so it's yeah the band the band remains a very sacred space yeah no that's well put well put jimmy and you know as i listen as i kind of did a little deep dive back into some of the older stuff you know just and and preparation for us talking today and and uh i guess if nothing else I, the best way for me to explain it is just like those songs were so unique and and um groundbreaking in their day 30 years ago you know 25 30 years ago and they're and they're still timeless to me like listening to tonight tonight for example I, I remember when i first heard that song i thought and i didn't know you yet we didn't meet until the late 90s that was 95 96 yes I think when, and and um 
I had immense respect for you then um, as, a, as a great, great drummer that you are. And I remember thinking, this guy, man, he thinks like, like, a, uh, like an orchestral drummer. Like he thinks, and I didn't really know your history really either. I, ha I think I had an inkling through things I'd read about you, like of your jazz background, but like it all made sense once I got to know you where this all came from because you, you think like, like a Tony Williams, the way Tony would, would create these, these parts, you know, like a, he, he'd build a section and, you know, the cross stick uh, part through Tonight Tonight. You know, it just, it's just, it's so dynamic. It takes you from one place to another to another. Um, and all these different suites throughout the song. And it's, it's, it's genius. I, I'm, I'm not using that word cavalierly. I'm, I truly mean that. It's, it's some incredible parts. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of that stuff was really, you know, I was talking to Billy about it yesterday because I've been obviously going through this stuff, as I said before. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it was really, you know, back then we were really, you know, a lot more Thelonious Monk than we were grunge. I mean, we were, we were really, you know, we were, we were really talking a lot about, you know, Monk and, and Mingus and Cole Porter and those types of arrangements where, you know, the narrative kind of reigns supreme and how can you be in service to the narrative and whilst maintaining, you know, getting your rocks off somehow. Um, so that was kind of, you know, we, we were, we, we were cognizant of that stuff and we really did. But again, I mean, a lot, a lot of that stuff just comes from listening. And I've, I've said this, you know, probably hundreds of times before, but a lot of that stuff was really a product of what I was listening to back then. I mean, I was listening to a lot of weather report. I was listening to, you know, Peter and Alex, um, you know, play that stuff. And that, you know, the Birdland side stick thing is just, it's the tonight tonight thing. It's like, yeah, I was, yeah. I love that part. I love the way that part just, lets you off the hook right and yeah. and then you know the 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 marching part is another part that kind of brings you in closer you know in a dynamic way much like you know Mr. Jasinski would do and like you know if you think in terms of that stuff you're you're and you're and you're and you're thinking like how am I going to how I'm going to add power and grace to this statement I think it allows you to like I said for me, it's just about making the correct choices. Like we can, we can all play things that are incongruent and we'd like to play things that are incongruent sometimes. But when you have a song, especially as tonight, tonight, it's really about, you know, not fucking it up as opposed to like, <laughs> I could play, I could, I mean, cause you can play two, four over the whole song. I've done it. I've done it in drum clinics and I've said, listen, listen to me play this drum part over the song. And people are like, eh, Right. So, you know, you've yeah. got to be willing to, you know, live in a bit of uncomfortability to, to kind of have those parts kind of parts come to you yeah. because, yeah. you know, Corgan, Corgan is the type of person where when you play something like that, he's like, oh, my God, I love that. And it, you may be thinking, like, I don't love it, you know, yeah. so you've got to be it's a tightrope walk. Right. So you, you're giving him something that you, you know, you're, you may be on the fence of, but him as a songwriter may have a deeper understanding of the destination of the song. And he'll say, I love it. I'll tell you why I love it later. Or later you'll understand why I love it as we, as this thing starts to germinate a little bit. So, so that's great to know that. So with that song in particular, do you, when you, when you guys wrote that song, Billy obviously had an idea of, of the form of the song. He brought it to you, brought it to you guys. And did you hear that? Did you hear that part kind of in your head immediately? Did you say to yourself, like this, I did. this would work? Per yeah, you did. Okay. I did. I did. And and the other part, I've said this before too. The other part was really, you know, Graham Lear, Gino Vanelli, like just to the Gemini, like to the war suite, you know, that the implication in that type of drumming. And, and oftentimes it's not really about the part. It's about the implication. Like, like when I listen to Elvin, right. There's, he's doing shit that like, unless I get struck by lightning, I'm probably never going to be able to do, but I like, <laughs> but I like, the, I like the way that it feels. Yeah. And this just goes back to the way I learned to play drums. Like I would hear stuff. I would like the way it made me feel, whether it was David Garibaldi or Elvin or Tony, whatever it was. Right. And then you go and kind of try to reverse engineer it in your own way. And, and oftentimes you would play, play it wrong because you couldn't see the guy playing it, but you would play your version of it. Right. So, so for me, like, 
it was <clears throat> those parts were about like the way they made me feel. There was a there was a victorious celebratory feeling in Graham's playing in that to the war suite on the Gino Vanelli record, which is, you know, those two records, just the Gemini and Storm at Sunup are some of the greatest drumming, recorded drumming of that period with Jeff Emmerich producing. It's all analog. I mean, the band is just on fire. Um, so with those with those two sensibility and the and the Birdland thing, which is always, you know, one of my favorite heavy weather is one of my favorite records. So Absolutely. especially, you know, Acuna and I've met Alex and just incredibly blistering playing on that stuff but but just having those things in your back pocket to be able to pull out and maybe you're not replicating them exactly but you're saying i want to create this feeling and tonight's and tonight's night's an interesting song billy billy woke up in the morning literally went to the piano and wrote that song start to finish and brought it in at noon that day and i think we worked on it that afternoon and really by like four o'clock the arrangement was done wow so and that's just, you know, when you when you have a songwriter that just like whoever's 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 downloading that stuff into him mm -hmm. and he's able to manifest it, it's pretty it's pretty crazy. And that happens with him more often than not, where he he'll will be in the studio with 20 songs to work on. And on day, you know, 18 out of 18 days, he'll come in with another song that's like becomes the best song on the record. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. You hear those um, situations. So, yeah. It's, yeah. And you're like, oh my God, not another song. Like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> but you, but you know, from knowing him for so long, that this, this, these are all worth working really hard on. Yeah, yeah. And you guys, it must be at a point now after working together for so long, where this, the obvious, it goes without saying, there's a trust. But yeah, you you both know what each other can do, and pro and probably he probably knows has an idea of what you're going to do. I'm guessing there's that sort of almost telepathic thing you start to feel where he starts to go maybe with an idea and, and you kind of even without even knowing it kind of know where it's probably going to go and come up with a part. pretty much. Yeah. I mean, he, yeah. you know, he, he's, he's really good at giving you the, the coloring book and letting you color, color it. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I, I always say like, you know, he lets me paint on his canvas, right? It's like I, I'm, I'm, I'm right there with him with with another brush, you know, brushing on these majestic paintings. I, you know, it's something I don't. It's something that I take pretty seriously. You know, I don't, I don't take it lightly. I, I try to show up, you know, over prepared all the time. I try to do, you know, my work at home, like with the last record, Autumn, thirty three songs. I mean, that's a lot of material. Yeah. Um, so when I started working on the drum arrangements here, I just had, I had all 33 songs in pro tools files and I just started recording drums in my studio. Uh, so when I showed up in Nashville at Blackbird, I had 33 songs in my back pocket with no notes. I had a real good understanding of all the emotional destinations of the songs and, you know, we recorded those drums, I think in 20 days. So it was like, you know, just kind of reeling them off and, and that gave us yeah. chances to rearrange and rewrite and rethink stuff but but yeah i mean it's it's a good gig i mean it's always been uh i always i i've had the benefit of knowing tons and tons of my contemporaries now and i know that all of their situations aren't like mine right i know a lot of drummers out there aren't in a situation like i'm in and you know it's easy well, corgan's got a great saying it's like it's easy to have integrity when you live in a mansion right <laughs> so it's like <laughs> um so I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't judge any of that stuff. I, I often wonder if it wasn't that way, you know, and I've never had to, I've, I've, I've proved, I've had to prove this to myself a couple of times in the band when I've left for whatever reason, either my kids or, or things weren't right. But I often wonder, you know, if I wasn't in that situation, what kind of drummer I would be and what, and if I would still even be a drummer, because those things are so the Tony, the Tony in it is so important to me because mm -hmm. that's why I started playing. Right. It's like, I wanted the guys that were representative of my goalposts were doing things their own way. The yeah. Max Roach, Shelly man, I mean, Bill Evans, right? Like, yeah. I mean, Danny Newmark, right. Or Jim Gordon or Mitch Mitchell, right. I mean, Mitch Mitchell was probably for me, 
was the person that really unlocked like he he unlocked the door that led from what my dad was listening to which was dave tuff and gene krupa right and and goodman dellington uh papa joe big pen i mean the first concert i ever saw was oscar peterson trio with ella fitzgerald and joe pass and like that was like how do you take that and move it into alternative rock well mitch mitchell was kind of the answer i mean you know, he was he was the guy for me that unlocked that door that led from big band jazz to rock and roll and did it in such a blistering, blistering way. I mean, his drumming is just on fire. Had you had you heard it, Elvin, before you heard Mitch Mitchell? Like, were you already hip to Elvin? And because no. no. OK, yeah, no. Yeah. So I reverse engineered a lot of that stuff. In fact, I never even listened to Tony and Miles till after I got the Lifetime record. So the first, the first Tony record I got was the was the was the not the first Lifetime record, but the one with Holdsworth and Allen and Tony Newton on it. That was like that was the record that stayed on my turntable for that for the, whatever that that whole yeah. summer. That record yeah. never got flipped over, but it never never left the turntable <laughs> until I could learn, you know, that Proto Cosmos was in three or you know what whatever the hell was going on there. And my mom would be like what are you trying to do down there? Right. <laughs> In my basement. <laughs> Cause you get the headphones on probably. And she's just right. hearing all this. Right. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. yeah. Um, right. So, um, but then, you know, where does this all come from? And then you go back and, and realize, and same with Cobham, right? Like, yeah, I knew Cobham from Mahavishnu, but then I discovered Cobham and Horace Silver's band, right. Or, and then, you know, with George Benson and like, you know, you start to understand that in order to play with that type of ferocious power, you've got to have an understanding of this delicate complexity on the other end of the spectrum. Right. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> there's a Jimmy, there's a question from, uh, you know, we're, we're live uh -oh. on, no, I'm just going to just read it. I think you'll, you'll like this. It's a good question. Um, and I was going to kind of get to this in a second. He's saying, uh, James, don't take were... credit for the question, John, come on. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> you know me too well. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I know. That's uh, what I would do. I would take credit for it. <laughs> uh, too funny. He said, uh, when you're at home and sit down to practice, what's your routine? If any, targeted rudiments, free jam, play along to music. Yeah, I very rarely free jam. I mean, once in a while, you know, I, if I'm working on stuff, like I'll, I'll, I'll go back, like, Right now I'm working on Jelly Belly, uh, the pumpkin song. So mm. I'll just put up a click and just kind of run those, run those down. Um, but generally my practice is all stick control. So it's literally the pad, the metronome and the zone book. And that's all, that's all I really ever practice. In fact, I had a, I donated a drum lesson to our uh, school auction every year. They, they, get me to donate a drum lesson and then somebody bids on it and the guy came over and he'd been playing for like eh, 15 years or so and uh good drummer mm -hmm. but just you know really really had some issues with his hands a little bit and we just sat down and worked on stick control for two hours and i just told him i said if you just if you go back and just work on this book for half hour a day you'll the next day you'll be better than you were the day before. And and I still feel that way about the book. That's I mean, funny. I feel like my hands, I met Clyde Stubblefield one time in a bar in Madison and um, he was in Madison. We were recording Gish. And uh, I said, you know, what's, what's your guiding light? Like what's, you know, we get, we got into a little bit of a drum discussion and he had heard about me through Butch Vig and he was saying, you know, Butch says you're a great drummer and blah, blah, blah. I said, you know, I, I'm a huge fan. I said, you know, what, without, you know, without setting your beer down, like what, what are you going to tell me? Right. And he would just say, like, I just know, like, when my, when my hands are even, I know the rest of my body's going to follow suit. He said, and most importantly, my right hand, like a lot of people think that my grooves are like kick snare. He said, but when I know like I'm playing right, it's like like my right hand's in the pocket. I don't have to worry about any of that other stuff. And that's kind of how I feel about stick control. When my subdivisions, when my subdivisions are accurate, the rest of my body follows suit, right? And 
that's kind of that's kind of the barometer for for me playing and that that book is just i got you know i got my original copy in it with the cover ripped off it's got a couple of phone numbers on it that I, i'm often <laughs> compelled to just to call to see who they are <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Uh, that could that could lead you down a dark hole there you I, know? I know man somebody, <laughs> some, some somebody who loves me is stopping me from doing that for sure um but uh but yeah that's kind of my that's kind of my practice regimen and you know i i try to work i try to work out stuff on the bandstand like when i'm playing with the pumpkins i'll i'll have a thought and i just try to do it i mean i I'm kind of still that guy that'll, I don't mind making a mistake here or there in a concert. <laughs> I'll, I'll kind of just go for, for whatever I'm hearing. You know, I like yeah. to, I think, I think, look, I think it's okay to be human. I think it's, I think, I think part of our job is to let people off the hook and know that like, I always tell my, my wife this, like when we set our baby down the first day we brought her home from the hospital, when she's squirming around on the floor, like a blob, right? all she's trying to do is be understood more clearly. Right. And that's kind of the, the human condition is really, that's what we're all trying to do. We're just trying to be understood more clearly and articulate how we're feeling more clearly. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it comes across very elegantly and other times it doesn't, but having both of those, I think is critical to being a human being. I think you need to be okay with, going for stuff right yeah, yeah i mean i know guys that have to play the same stuff every night and i'm and i'm like i can't i can't do that man i don't even like to walk through the same door every time i come into my house i'm just like i'm i'm not wired like that yeah yeah and corgan will tell you like i i'm always trying you know obviously i play the signature licks and the songs and the and the motifs and all that stuff but in between that stuff i'm always adding an offbeat hi-hat or no, I've got spokes over here, which is a, you know, it's a whole nother element of, of yeah. timekeeping. So, you know, I, I like, to, I like to do that stuff. Uh, and I've got Vic Salazar now as my drum tech, who's, you know, she's my drum set. Every time I come to a tour, there's more pieces to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Bozio influence on Vic. I know. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> I got to give a big shout out to Vic. I know he can't be with you or why he told me he's loading in for rehearsal today for yes. you guys so he can't be uh, watching but big shout out to Vic and I want to shout out I'm, I'm sure he's not watching but the guy that connected us back in 1999 was Timmy Doyle who was your tech oh, at the yeah. time and I yeah. just want to hopefully he'll see this when it's on YouTube and I want to thank him again for connecting us almost 25 years ago and um, I was such a huge fan of yours and I'll never forget this he called me when you you had left the pumpkins and you were back in the band and he had been Joey Kramer's tech for many years and we'd become I knew him from working with Matt Sorum so anyway we were good friends sure. and he called and he said I'm working for Jimmy Chamberlain and he said would you be interested in signing Jimmy to Zildjian and I'm like is this a joke <laughs> are you kidding me <laughs> and he and he said I've been talking to him and he's interested and you know can I have him call you or something and I think a day later you called me and we had our first conversation I think we spoke probably for two hours about all the stuff we're talking about now and Tony and, I know, right? and yeah and cymbals and drums and and that was it and I was just so excited and I want you to know this Jimmy that 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 was one of the highlights of my career was was oh thank you signing you really you and it was me. it was one of mine too I mean being on the Zildjian roster was incredibly you know I mean it's like even the modern drummer stuff I mean I've been on modern drummer I don't know how many times but I used to do it like you, like we used to sit on our bed and just dream about like, yeah, and not think, you know, the chances of me being on this cover, whatever, but I know if I work hard that there's, there's a small chance. I mean, and it was the same with Zildjian. I mean, we, I used to think like Zildjian, you guys must, they must be the richest people in the world because their stuff is so expensive. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, uh. Uh, that's so I mean, funny. you know, when you're a kid, you're like, yeah, Damn, yeah. they must, and if it costs more, they must make me like, but, um, but yeah, that was an incredible, and that was an incredible time at Zildjian. I mean, I, it's yeah. funny you say that because Jim McGaffey reached out to me on LinkedIn uh, a couple a uh, couple months ago, and he's doing some charity stuff that him and I are going to connect on at some point. But he was oh, he great. was around uh, around at Lenny DiMuzio and and all those guys. And I right. remember when the Constantinopolis came out, what a big deal it was. And I mean, yeah. I changed my I changed my whole sound because those symbols were were so great. 
I remember that. And I remember that was a big part of why you wanted to, you were, we ta- uh, that first conversation, we had just come out with him and you were very keen to it. And it, what surprised me at that time, and I was thinking about this listening to the older records is, again, this was just me not really knowing the full sort of history of your, of your kind of, um, you know, your whole, the genesis of your playing. But um, like when you listen to the older pumpkin stuff, your ride cymbal tended to be a little you know, a little more pointed sounding, more of like a, a pingy, you know, which was the mm-hmm. sort of sound of that time. And it would, you know, cut through the, the, the band well. But I remember when us, have, us having that first conversation and you were like, really, you're like, man, that, you know, that I love that dark Tony sound, <laughs> that Elvin sound. And, and, and you, I sent you some of those symbols and you, you integrated them perfectly in the, in the band. I mean, they sounded perfect. And once you put them in there, you know, it was, yeah, there was, a, a I mean, thing. those, those were game changers for me. And they let me, they led me down, you know, an even darker path of symbols. And I know you're not, you know, Zildjian anymore. So I can tell you like the Istanbul stuff is, is kind of where those fifties, those fifties K's kind of landed. Right. I remember yeah. talking to, talking to Brian blade when the, uh, when the chick trio stuff came out and I was like, I was, I was struggling with Zildjian to try to, to make me stuff that was dark enough so I talked to Brian, I think via email, and I said, "What the hell? What is, what is that symbol you're playing?" And, <laughs> and he said, you, "It's a '50s 24-inch K. You know, you can't, you don't make these anymore. I mean, you can't." He's like, "I, I guard it with my life because I know it can never be replicated." So when I met Scott Lichen at Istanbul and realized that those guys were were you know were, their starting point was darker than the darkest Zildjian, I was like, "Okay, I'm all in." And that stuff allows you to bring your baseline dynamic down and, and yep. really, really, uh, and really kind of reinterpret the drums, uh, for more of a swell, more of an implication. I think as I get older, I'm more into that kind of sweeter, that sweeter, darker tone tones, and even, you know, less resonance on the drums and kind of where, <laughs> where Jim Gordon started is kind of yeah. where I'm going to end. Right. Hopefully. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, you know, that, and that's, I, I, it's not that unusual, you know, to hear you say that, Jimmy, did, that it's like you've, you, you've, um, you, you know, your, your ears have matured, you know what I mean? In, in a good way. And that you, you're definitely more of a nuanced player and listener. And, um, and I, you know, I, you've always had a discerning ear though. And I was going to talk about that. I made a note of just, you know, how I just even going back to, Again, the older record. Hey, I just got and, an email from Joe Testa at Zildjian. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> is he watching this? He's going, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. uh, Joe, come on. <laughs> We're trying to do a show here. Uh, Where's the no. sticks I ordered? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great, man. That is great. No, but I was going to say, you know, like listening to the, to the older records and the new record, too, um, your sound is just amazing. It's just, it's always been amazing. It's always been a cut above, like, um, and, and where I'm going with this question, it's, it is a question, but I just want to make that statement. First of all, that you've always had an incredible drum sound. And I've seen you live a number of times. I remember you did a PASIC or a couple of PASICs where, um, you know, I, I just remember really getting up close to your kit and, and seeing the, the care that you put into the sound of your drums and I just, I respect that so much, Jimmy. And that, that's, that's such a big part of your, your reputation as not only just the great drummer you are, but like you've, you got all the, all the bases covered. And that, to me, Jim Gordon is another guy that was known for that. Like a great, great player played way better than people probably realize, right? I mean, a lot more chops than what you might hear on some of those records. And yeah. on top of that, you know, um, Jeff Picaro used to talk about this. Jim Keltner does he always had an amazing sound, just a, yeah. a great sound, a great ear. But where I'm going with this is, do you have uh, involvement with the engineers when you guys record? Do you, do you have, uh, I know Billy produces a lot of the stuff and you've had Butch Vig and you've had other great producers. I'm guessing you get to have a, a hand in that to some degree to, in terms of your drum sound. and. Yeah, I'm, I'm there from the first day, you know. Yeah. I'm generally doing... Um, you know, Vic, Vic will get the drums close and then I'm, I'm doing the fine, fine tuning. Um, and then, you know, we mic them up and we, we sit there and listen to them and they're, they, 
they trust me to deliver, you know, I, I'm bringing a quality kit down. Um, and, you know, their job is to make the drums sound as good on the, on the record as they do to me. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty involved, but I'm also, I'm also willing to, you know, experiment with stuff too. I mean, I, I understand like, you know, some songs want a drier, like generally when, when we mic a drum kit, we'll, we'll mic it from like, okay, we want to close mic it so we can get one type of sound. We want to have enough room mics to where we can wet the sound up and we want to have options, right? So we'll, we'll generally have anywhere from, you know, 30 to 40 mics on the drum kit. Um, and I could send you, send you photos. Like when we, when we record at Blackbird, there's a lot of channels and Pro Tools obviously affords us a lot of, a lot of inputs. Um, but it allows us to make the drum set big or make the drum set small. But if the drum set isn't in tune, like all of that stuff kind of goes out the window, right? So right. A, a drum set that's in tune with itself, um, where, the, where the kick drum is in tune with the toms and the snare drum is in the right frequency, the cymbals aren't too pingy, right? Um, and I'll even take like, put some moon gel on a ride cymbal to dry it up. I'll do, I'll do a lot of things to kind of, to. to tame tame symbols down um but yeah i i'm 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 in i'm in yeah. i'm in i'm in the, the booth listening to the drums and they're asking me you know if i should they want to if i want to change anything or if they, i think we have all the bases covered now in the post-production when when billy's mixing and and howard or we send it to you know any one of the various people that mix it mix our records we're sending it to them because we trust their ear, right? We're saying like, we want your opinion on this. We want you to mix it in a way that's contemporary, but still honors what we're trying to accomplish here. And we've been, you know, we've been, you know, whether it's Ryan or Howard or, you know, uh, Dave, um, you know, we, we've been, we've been really, we're really picky, right? We're, I mean, we're, yeah, we're sure. really picky and, and, we all are. We're all we're all super picky. And I'm not picky about like where my ride symbol's gotta be three point two inches away from my tom. I'm I, I don't care about that stuff. Vic sets my stuff up. If stuff's off, I don't care. I enjoy like not sitting the same way every night or moving this way a little bit more. If drums are out of place, I don't care, but out of tune it drives me crazy. <laughs> no, that's great to know that. Yeah, and, and I figured you had to be in the center of that because that's uh, you know, it's your sound. It's your signature sound, and uh, and it gets yeah. it gets it gets silly sometimes. I mean, one when we did the Zwan record, uh, Alan Mulder and I worked on the drums at Steve Albini's studio here in Chicago, and I think we spent I think we spent <laughs> I think we had a big budget, right? <laughs> I think we spent ten days on the bass drum, just oh moving God. it around, and we were like, you know, we were driving ourselves crazy, and then we were like, where do we have it the first day? You know, it was like one of those. We got oh, to be yeah, like chasing. Yeah. And then we ended up recording the, a lot of the drums back at our practice space because we knew what that sounded like. It was like, <laughs> I mean, you can drive yourself nuts with this stuff. Yeah. yeah. In my studio, I'm I'm a, I'm a lot more forgiving. I have, you know, I have uh, a distressor on my snare drum, uh, a couple compressors, uh, an even tide, and then I'm just good to go. And I try to try to. And the other thing like live that we do now is all of our guitars are in ISO cabinets. So the only live thing on the, on that stage is the drums. Mm -hmm. So now in a big arena, we're able to really lean heavily on the overheads. Yeah. So you're yeah. really getting a great, yeah. Then I can, you know, I'm self mixing them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's great. That's, that's an ideal situation. That's, it really is. One of the best live drum sounds I've heard in recent <laughs> years was Steve Smith with journey and and you know using the the sound guy and I remember Steve telling me at the beginning of the tour he was the the front of, front of house guy was used to the way Dean played which was a lot heavier so he yeah. tended to, to to mix the overheads pretty low um and it just and I, I said to Steve after one of the first shows I said man I, I I gotta tell you the drum sound was not happening it was not kind of what I expected and then I saw him about a year later and it was night and day Jimmy I mean truly night yep. and day and, and he said the sound guy I've he said to him, look, I play a lot lighter than Dean and you can really crank those overheads and you can make them yep. work. And yeah, that's, 
That's me too. I, I'm the same. I, I don't, I don't play hard. I mean, I use those modern jazz for the maple sticks that are yeah. like a five B blank, but they're super light. And I think, um, I think Vic told me on the 2018 tour, we didn't break one stick. So, wow. I mean, yeah. So, you know, yeah. I just, and, and of course, you know, it's a lot of that is just playing correctly or whatever. And I was going to say, know, yeah, you use technique. proper hand technique and stuff and you're not, you know, like hammering and holding the drumsticks like that but but you don't really need to play that loud to to get velocity right and it's if right. you start with a reasonable baseline dynamic i mean you look at buddy play right when you see buddy play with a big band i mean he's not playing hard i mean he looks like he's playing hard but he's choking way up on those sticks right. and i've got a set I, I played in the studio in la and the guy goes hey buddy rich recorded here in the 60s and he left a bunch of drumsticks around you want a pair I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? What? Oh my God. <laughs> so he gave me this, I don't know who they were like Rogers sticks or something. I don't know. Remember all the drum companies were made their own yes. sticks back then. So it was like yeah. a Rogers, Rogers sticker. And it was like, holy cow, man, I can't use these. These are so small pencils. I know. They were like, yeah. But yeah. you know, when you see him play, I mean, it's the volume is there. Exactly. Yeah, I know. I know. Okay. That's the end of part one. If you enjoyed it, give it a like and uh, even leave a comment. If you didn't enjoy it, maybe uh, like it anyway, but don't leave a comment. Uh, but I do hope you enjoyed it. I appreciate you listening and watching and stay tuned for part two. That's coming soon. Remember, no drummers are ever harmed on live from my drum room. And uh, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks. I'll see you soon.